Hello. <laughs> Good morning, church. <laughs> I'm glad that you're here. I'll say this all again so the internet can hear us. Um, thankful that we can all be together this morning. I would like to open up um, with a word from Philippians. And this is some pretty popular uh, piece of scripture, but it's really been encouraging me this week when it starts out with rejoice always because I forget that it, um, I have so much to be thankful for. And he starts off with that and he says, rejoice in the Lord always. In case you forgot, I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. This has encouraged me because in everything, with prayer and petition, I can, I can like nag God's ear off in a way but I do it in thanksgiving like he is there to hear it all and then I thank him too for how he's always been faithful to me and how he's providing and how he's going to come through in this thing that I'm praying about right now and then I can leave it there and then I can have his peace Amen. so I pray that encourages your hearts this morning and in, that you remember why we're here to worship him let's pray Father, I thank you for your goodness. Um, I thank you that you are all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good. Thank you for creating us, for having a plan of salvation when we messed up, and for not giving up on us, not just wiping things clean and starting afresh, but for making us new. Thank you for your renewing grace in our lives. I thank you for this beautiful weather um, and just seeing the seasons change and your beauty in the world, how it's a little bit easier this time of year. Um, and I just pray that we would be able to worship you with our whole hearts this morning, Lord, to give you everything that you are worthy of, to praise you, to glorify your name, Lord. Do your, let your Holy Spirit work in us through the preaching of your word and singing songs of praise. So that we can renew um, our desire to live for you and to be steadfast after you. We love you. Amen. Amen. So today is Songfest this evening at 6 p.m. It'll be held out in the parking lot so that you can come and social distance. If any of you are watching online and you don't prefer to be around others or wearing a mask, you, this is something that you can come to and stay in your car and still be with the church. Um, if you do want to sit outside, if weather permitting, you can bring the lawn chairs too or blankets and we'll sit outside and enjoy praising the Lord together. So that's tonight at six. And then a reminder for next week, we'll be receiving our alabaster offering on the 27th. And all of this money is given to alabaster, which goes to build facilities in the mission field. Other countries who might not have the financial resources to build a building for the church to come or schools, or whatever they need, that's what this money is going to, and it's ultimately to further the gospel. Amen. And I would like to invite Angela up here. She has something to share with us. Man, some of y'all haven't seen me in like forever, and I haven't seen you in like forever, because I'm in the back, and social distancing, and all this quarantine stuff, so... I am your church secretary, whether y'all know it or not. I do go to the board meetings and other things. Um, so I um, have an announcement I got from the superintendent from um, the church district, um, Jeffrey Kunselman. I want to read that to the congregation today. So friends in Christ, it is my pleasure to inform you that in harmony with the provisions of the 2017-2021 manual of the Church of Nazarene, Paragraph 123, which relates to the regular church pastoral review. The official ch church board of the Salina Church of the Nazarene has affirmed the continuation of the ministry of Reverend Chris Riffle, pastor of the church. <laughs> During our meeting, we discussed plans directly related to our Christ-given commission to go and make disciples. 
As provisioned by our manual, paragraph 122, the pastor and the church board will conduct an annual planning session to review the expectations and goal of the church. A regular church pastoral review will be scheduled in another four years. Rejoice and celebrate with you. I rejoice and celebrate with you in the spirit of love and unity in your church. My prayer is that God will anoint you as the endeavor to bring others to our Savior and into the fellowship of his church. Sincerely, Jeffrey Kunzelman, District Superintendent. So um, this is very exciting news, as y'all already clapped. Um, and so we just wanted to give uh, a tangible appreciation for everything that, that Pastor does for the church and for Gretchen. Gretchen was, was Gretchen's over there. She doesn't want to say hi to everybody. She can stand up and at least wave. Since y'all don't see her a lot either, come on up, Gretchen. Pastor, come on up. Um, I know Gretchen and I are always in the back, so we don't see everybody. So y'all need to see her beautiful face. You can take your mask off. People want to see you. Yeah. <laughs> and so thank y'all very much. Um, I know y'all are going on vacation in a couple weeks, so we were hoping that this would help out in that vacation. Y'all can have a special dinner or special... Um, we have a party. But anyway, so thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. We just uh, appreciate you guys so much. I'm so, so very thankful for the Salina Church and to just be here and love on the kids, love on you. God is good. Amen. Thank you. And uh, I want to just echo that sentiment. Uh, we believe we're in the center of God's will. And I know we're at kind of unusual times right now in terms of ministry and how to move forward. But uh, this won't last forever. We'll get right. post-COVID at some point. And uh, your love and support, and we'll, along with uh, God with us, we'll be able to continue to impact lives for Jesus Christ, which Amen. it's all about. And so thank you so much. For, uh, for just who you are. We love every single one of you. And those of you watching online that can't be here in person, you're still a part of this church. And we love you and we look forward to the time when we can all be together again. And so thank you very much. Thank you again for for that uh, support and uh, and for your love and I'm kind of moving on with what we have going on here. Um, we will be uh, preparing our hearts to uh, receive our offering today, and uh, obviously we're not taking up an offering. You know the routine. We got offering boxes set up around, and I just want to thank you for your <laughs> continued faithful giving to the Lord's work during these very unusual days. And uh, so just be thinking about God's goodness and uh, what he's done for you and uh, our response back in supporting his work. And uh, Donna will be singing our <coughs> song. And is she up here? Yeah. Okay. Donna will be singing our song here in just a minute uh, as we reflect on the Lord's goodness. But I do want to mention a couple other quick things. First of all, um, every year we have, the district puts on what they call Empower the Church Tour. And it's a, uh, a night of just gathering together with others on the district. And uh, we have a, share a nice meal together. And then we receive just some training on how to better fulfill the Great Commission. Different ideas and things like that. And so I would encourage you, if you are a leader in the church... A board member, if you're involved in Sunday school and teaching anything in particular, or if you're just interested in wanting to grow in your knowledge of how to better disciple people, uh, you're more than welcome to come. Sign-up sheet is on the West Bulletin Board, where it always is, and uh, the church will pay your way, and we'll arrange transportation, keeping in mind all the COVID uh, precautions, and as well as when you go, there'll be having those things in place also. But if you're able to come, I just invite for you to sign up and be a part of that. And then the last thing I want to mention is uh, next Saturday, um, Franklin Graham is uh, organizing a thing that's going nationwide 
um, of uh, praying for the country, doing a walk and a prayer for our country. And, um, and it, there's going to be a march in Wapakoneta. Um, and details are on a sheet that's hanging up on the West Bulletin Board as well. But it's in Wapakoneta next Saturday, 2 o'clock. And if you can be a part of that, I um, encourage you to do so. If you can't physically be there, maybe stop wherever you're at at 2 o'clock Saturday and just pray for your nation. I think we'd all be in agreement. Our nation needs prayer. Amen. Amen. And so uh, let's call upon the Lord. So I want to keep those things in mind. But uh, Donna, if you would uh, go ahead and uh, bless us with what God's laid on your heart.
Thanks, Donna. Let's worship and praise together. Let's stand together as we sing, All hail the power of Jesus' name. That includes you in this second verse. Watch the words closely. You ransomed from the fall. He ransomed you. So we no longer have to be with sin, death, hell, and the grave. But heaven as our home. Let's sing together and worship together and praise him. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him, Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him, Lord of all. And Lord of Lords. Amen. Thank you, Amen. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated as we continue to worship this morning. I heard on the radio this week that someone said, I do all these good things. I'm going to heaven. I, I help my neighbor. I mow their yard. I rake their leaves. I do all these great things. And um, I'm, I know I'm, on, I'm going to heaven. But we know, church, that's only through the name of Jesus who gives us to the Father. And the Father says, welcome home, you good and faithful servant. And I appreciate Casey giving us scripture from Philippians. Because in Philippians chapter 2, it says to us that Jesus, who thought not himself worth same as God or equal to God, humbled himself and came to this earth for us. And became in his appearance as as a man. But he was humble and gave himself even unto death, even the death of a cross. Therefore, God gave him the name above every name, whether in heaven or on earth or under the earth, that every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Let's worship him this morning. He's the healer. He's our defender. He's our redeemer. He's our coming king. He was, he is, and he is to come. He's our king. He's our Lord. Let's worship him this morning.
Thank you. 
praise. And of course, if you know your Bible, you know that imagery of that song comes from the book of Revelation, a book filled with all kinds of praise in heaven. And uh, one thing, you know, I'm currently reading the book of Revelations in my devotions. I read two chapters in the Old Testament, one chapter new every night. And uh, one thing that you really get out of the book of Revelation it's just how awesome God is that we serve. I mean, John just, you can almost feel for the Apostle John who's received this revelation. He's trying to search for the language to describe what he's seeing here. And uh, it's just incredible. The glory of the God we serve. We we're talking in Sunday school about how God's a personal God, and he is. But we also need to keep in mind that he is transcendent. He is above all else. His, the whole earth is filled with his glory. The whole universe is filled with his glory. And we get to worship him and we get to know him. And we get to walk with him. What an awesome salvation we have in Christ. And as we go to the Lord in prayer, we uh, want to... Uh, our special prayer emphasis this week is remembering our Nazarene missions, and we want to remember specifically our work in Honduras. Uh, we did a little kids uh, club video, or can't remember, it was kids worship, I think kids worship video a couple weeks ago on it. And one of the amazing things God is doing in Honduras is they have uh, these uh, trash heaps, these places where they just dump trash. 
And people started living around these trash heaps because they had nothing to live on. And so they would just spend their days scouring through the trash to either find food they could eat or materials that they could use to clothe themselves or to build a little shelter or maybe even some things they could sell for scrap just to make a little money. And that's how they were living. And there was a Nazarene couple who who saw that happening and their hearts were moved with compassion and they just began showing up and handing out like cookies to the children. But it soon became evident they needed far more than that. And so they started teaching classes on basic hygiene and, and uh, teaching classes on how to care for yourself and bringing other supplies along. Before long, it just became a ministry and it, they, they started Sunday school classes, first for the kids, but then the adults started coming. And the adults started receiving Christ as their Savior. And out of that, God just birthed this whole work amongst these trash piles. And the Church of the Nazarene is right there. Now there's church there in that area. There's schools in that area. They're working with the government and building homes for these people. All of this done through your church, the Church of the Nazarene. Just another sliver of a story of what's going on because you give to missions, and you pray for missions. So God's alive and well. He's working. And I just encourage you, as we pray for Honduras, we're going to remember that work. And that's not all the things God is doing in Honduras. That's just one story. And, uh, and so we're going to lift that up. And then, of course, we're going to pray for our country and our church. And, uh, and for those of you recovering from surgeries, dealing with ongoing physical issues, some of you are facing surgery here shortly, and we're just going to lift all that up to the Lord. So let's call upon God. And today, if you have a special burden, something you just like to give to the Lord, you know the altar's open, and feel free to come and just bring it to Him. But let's all call upon Him today. Father, we are so grateful for how awesome You are. Lord, your word says that the heavens of heaven cannot contain your glory. You're greater than your creation. And when we look at your creation, we can see how great you are in it. Everything from the smallest detail that you need microscopes to see to the largest expanse of the universe that we need telescopes to view. All of it, Lord, declares your glory, but it's just a reflection of it. You're greater than all of that. And yet somehow, Lord, not are you just transcendent, but you're imminent. You're close to us. As we were reminded of, the book of Philippians tells us that you thought it not uh, anything be considered to be equal to God, but Lord, you humbled yourself and became a man and became a servant and humbled yourself even unto death so that you could pay the price for our sin and we could be reconciled and brought back to you. Lord, from beginning to end, you've done it all. And we thank you for the salvation that we have. Not just the assurance of heaven, as great as that is, but we get to walk with you. We get to follow you. We get to have your spirit inside of us. We get to sense your comfort in those times of grieving. We get to sense your strength when we are so weak. We get to sense hope rising up within us in times of despair. We get to experience your forgiveness if we go wayward. We get to experience your grace in all of its facets because you came to us. And so this morning, Father, we just... We just want the world to know this hope. There's so many in darkness. There's so many who have no idea of the life of Jesus that's, that's afforded to them. Let alone what awaits in eternity. They're walking in darkness. So I pray, Lord, for our church. I pray you would help us even during these times of COVID. I know we're all kind of waiting for the after COVID. But even now, Lord... We can be an influence for Jesus. 
Even with all the different restrictions and things, Lord, that are on us, we can still be an influence for you. We heard testified in Sunday school how, how someone was able to share faith in Christ. And Lord, we all have opportunities of that. So give us boldness, give us love, give us the eyes to see the need right before us. Help us to be the hands and feet and heart of Jesus in whatever way that looks out throughout the week. And help our church, Lord, to be able to minister in a powerful way. We understand that our church is not just the programs we put on. It's not just the ministries we have and as an organization. We are the church. And help us, Father, to fulfill your call to go into the world and preach the gospel to every preacher, every creature. Help us, Lord. And we pray for our country as well. We pray, Father, we are a wounded country. And truth be told, we've always been wounded. We've always needed you. But, Lord, in the last few months, uh, it's really come to light just how far we've drifted and how much we need you. And so, Father, we pray for healing. And the healing, of course, starting with the church starting with us, but not ending with us, but going out and impacting our world. Lord, we've seen you do great moves of your spirit in times past, revivals that weren't just local in nature, but swept over continents and radically altered the history of mankind. And Lord, that's what we need. That's what we need in these times of despair. And that's what we cry for, understanding, Lord, we're putting ourselves directly in the path of that and saying, oh, while on others you are calling, do not pass me by. Change my heart. Change my nature to reflect more your nature. And so, Father, we just pray our country would experience that kind of revival, that kind of turning to you. And Lord, we also pray for our work in Honduras. We thank you for those called to minister and we thank you for the miraculous things, Lord, that you are doing in that country, the lives that are being impacted for you. And we ask your blessing upon it for those in charge of the work. Give them the wisdom to do the right things at the right times. Uh, and for those, Lord, the work is intended for, give them ears to hear and a heart to receive the, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And may there be a great impact and revival through the work of the Church of the Nazarene, as well as the work of other Christians that are in that area as well. And Father, we just thank you for all you've done, and we know it's just the beginning of what you want to do. And Lord, we also pray for those in our midst, in our church, that are dealing with physical issues. There's many I could mention by name. But Lord, you know every single one, those dealing with ongoing issues, those recovering from surgeries, those who will be entering into surgeries. And we just ask, Lord, that your healing virtue would flow from the hem of your garment into their lives. And they would be made not just healed, but whole whole in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for touching their bodies, their minds, and their souls. I pray encouragement to those who are discouraged this morning. Oh God, be the lifter of our head as we look to you. We thank you for being a God that hears these prayers. And even now, Lord, things are happening in the spiritual realm we can't even see because we've taken time to call upon you this morning. Thank you for who you are as we pray all this in the mighty, powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Well, once again, it's good to be able to worship with you today. And uh, we take time in our services to pray because it's not just a formality. It's what we believe God calls the church to do when they gather together is to pray and we believe that God hears our prayer and answers them. And so that's why we pray. And it's so wonderful to see you here today. And I trust now you are ready to receive from God's word. I believe God has a very encouraging 
an important word for us this morning. I want to talk to you this morning about moving from a mess to a miracle. And so if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to the book of Mark, chapter number 6, verses 45 through 51. And while you're turning to that, let me talk to you just a little bit about artwork. You probably don't know a whole lot about art unless you've studied it. But in art, there is a certain style of painting that is called photorealism. And as the name implies, it's the type of painting where you try to make your painting look just like a photograph. To the point that those who are really skilled in that, and you're looking at their artwork, you have to do a double take. Is that a painting or is that really a picture? I mean, they put every little detail in. The lighting's perfect. Everything's just like it would be in a photograph. It's called photorealism. And that's one type of painting. But kind of the polar opposite of that kind of painting, besides maybe just abstract painting, would be what you would call impressionistic painting. And this is a type of painting where a lot of strokes are used, and from a distance, all these different colors and strokes and things, blend. your eye blends them together to create a picture, usually with some sort of effect. But up close, the details don't make any sense. When you're looking at it up close, it looks like just a bunch of blobs and blurs and brush strokes that don't come together and form anything. And I mention that because in life, if you could compare life to a style of painting, I would say life is much more like an impressionistic style of painting than photorealism. Because life, a lot of times up close, <laughs> it doesn't make sense, right? Right? You've been there. Why is this happening? Why did God allow this? I don't understand. Lord, why don't you do that? It seems so clear to me. This is the way we should. And so we're up close to things, and it just looks like life, a lot of random strokes, a lot of random things that don't tie together, that don't make any sense, that even contradict and clash against one another. But of course, we also understand that as Christians, our perspective is not always the truth. That when you're able to step back and see it from God's perspective, all those different things tie together, blend together to create a beautiful picture of what God is trying to do both in your life as well as in his plan for everybody. And so I am talked about all that because... I want to speak to you today about a God who can take our mess. And when I say mess, that should be in quotes, really, because from our perspective, it may look like a mess. But he's working out a miracle in it. He's taking those random strokes that don't make any sense to us, and he's creating something beautiful out of it. He's a God that brings order out of chaos, meaning out of the muddle. How God will lead us from the mess to a miracle. And as I said, when looking at all these different stories in the Bible, it's probably nothing you haven't heard before. But man, we need reminded of it time and time and time and time again. Or I'll personalize that. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you never do. But I need reminded of it time and time and time again. So we're in Mark chapter 6, verses 45 through 51, because this is just an example of of what I'm talking about. God taking a mess, what looks like a mess, and turning it into a miracle. And so uh, let's go ahead and read the scripture. Chapter 6, verses 45 through 51. And uh, by the way, a little background here. Jesus had just fed the 5,000. And if you remember the story, right after that, Mark doesn't really record this, but other gospel writers do, they wanted to, the, the crowd wanted to take Jesus by force and make him king. They were ready to put a crown on his head and march him into Jerusalem and say, this is it, Rome, we're declaring independence. And of course, that wasn't part of God's plan whatsoever. And so Jesus... Uh, uh, gets them out of that situation pretty quick. And so that's where we pick up uh, the reading here. Immediately, that's immediately after he fed the 5,000, Jesus made his disciples. And that word made in the Greek is very strong, forceful 
word. He made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida. And while he dismissed the crowd, so now the crowd's gone, after leaving them, he, meaning Jesus, went on the mountaintop or mountainside to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on the land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost and they cried out because they saw him and were terrified. And immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. He then climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down, and they were completely amazed. Going from a mess to a miracle, bringing order out of chaos. And that's what we see in this story. But as I said, this story is not alone. There's examples in, in other scripture of Jesus doing the same thing. I think about creation. You remember how the Bible begins? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was void and without form, and darkness was on the face of the deep. The earth was chaotic. There didn't seem to be any order to it, any purpose to it. It was just kind of there with darkness. But God, the Spirit of God, hovered over the waters. And then God said, and it was done. And when God said, and it was done, God began the whole creation account as recorded in Genesis 1 and 2 is God bringing order and purpose and meaning out of what looks like just chaos and darkness. And that's, we see that in the creation account. We see that in the story of Hezekiah. You remember Hezekiah in the Old Testament? One of the most godly kings Judah had. But even though he was godly, of follow, even though he did his best to follow the Lord, he hit some rough patches there. And there was a time when the Assyrian nation was surrounding Jerusalem, threatening their very existence, threatening to take over Judah, just as they'd done the northern kingdom of Israel. And as a matter of fact, the commander of the army sent a letter to Hezekiah saying, don't think God's going to deliver you. Doesn't this sound like Satan? Don't think God's going to deliver you from me. Did any of the other gods of the other nations deliver them? Of course, I'm paraphrasing here. And, and they didn't deliver. Your God's not going to be able to help you. And you know what Hezekiah did? He did what every single one of us should do when Satan whispers things like that in our ear. He went directly to the Father. And he took that letter and he laid it on the altar of God there in the temple. And he said, look what he says about you. But I know, Lord, you will deliver me. I know you will come through for me. And that night God took action. And the Bible says an angel of the Lord went out among the encamped uh, Assyrian nation that, remember, was surrounding Jerusalem. Remember, I'm talking about a mess to a miracle. That was a mess he was facing. There was an army of probably over 200,000 men surrounding the city. Hezekiah had nothing to fight them with, nothing. He, he was defeated. I mean, the letter in the natural was, was true. There was nothing Hezekiah could do. But he went to his father in heaven. And God moved that night and did the impossible. He sent an angel among the Assyrian encampment. And he killed 185,000 of them. And the Assyrian, whoever was left, just got up and said, this isn't for us. And they left. Mess out, from a mess to a miracle. We see it all through the Bible. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know their story? Three Hebrew children. <laughs> They're in the land of Babylon trying to live for God in that pagan land. And King Nebuchadnezzar gets the idea, I'm going to make a statue of myself. You talk about an egotistic guy. <laughs> I'm going to make a statue of myself made of gold. Uh, the Bible says the statue was 90 feet tall. 
And so they created the statue of this king. And then he gave the edict, everyone is to bow before the statue and worship the image. Well, for most people in the kingdom, a big deal. What's one more God to the 20 others we bow before? They didn't care. But to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who worship the one and true God, it was a big deal. And they were in a mess. I mean, they're out of their homeland. They're in this foreign country. And now they're being told to bow before this image of this egotistic king who had a temper. What were they to do? A lot of people say, oh, just just do a quick little bow. God knows you're not going to mean it. That's not what they did. They stood firm and they stood, when when the trumpets blared, they, they didn't make a huge deal of it. It was the king who made a huge deal of it. They simply didn't bow. Everyone around them bowed, but they did not. So the king calls them over and says, why aren't you bowing? And they explain, well, well, we worship the one true God. We're not going to bow before you. Your image, we can't. And King Nebuchadnezzar gets mad, furious. He fires up the furnace seven times hotter than normal. And then he says, bind these three up and throw them in the furnace. Talking about a mess. This is a mess, isn't it? Man, they're going to die here. They're going to die a horrible death. That doesn't sound like a very good way to die if there is a good way to die. A horrible death. They're bound up. They're thrown into the furnace. But you know what happened? God was in there with them. And they got thrown into that fire and the Bible says... Nothing was burned. Not a hair on their head was singed. Their clothes were not burned. Of course, they suffered no harm. The only thing that got burned off were the ropes that tied them. Right there is a lesson. Everything else was, as a matter of fact, when King Nebuchadnezzar looked into the furnace, he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Then we just, then we throw three people in. I see four people walking in the fire. Four of them. And one of them looks like the son of God. And they stepped out of that furnace with quite a testimony. From a mess to a miracle. God does it over and over again in scripture. Paul and Silas, I think of them, chained to the Philippian jail wall. You remember that? Arrested simply for following God, for doing what God told them to do. He said, go to this area, preach. They're doing that. They get arrested. They get beaten. They get chained to the wall. They don't even know if they're going to live to see tomorrow. They're in a mess. But you know what they chose to do? Chained to that wall? Not sit there and gripe and complain and God, well, I've tried to be faithful and this is how you repay me. And No, they didn't do that. The Bible says that at midnight, what were they doing? Singing praises to God. And then I love this line, the other prisoners heard them. Wow. That's, that's our testimony right there. Anyone can praise God when, when great things happen. And we should, by the way. But the real testimony of the world is when you're in the fire, you're, you're in a situation, and you're still praising God. The other prisoners heard them. They were in a mess. Backs beaten raw, chained to a dungeon wall, not knowing if they would face death the next day or not. But they were praising God, and then you know the story. The mess became a miracle. God invaded that place. The ground shook. The chains fell off. The doors swung open. But the real miracle wasn't that. The real miracle was they didn't run anywhere. No, but the jailer fell at their feet and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What do I need to do to know this God that's just done this for you? This God that you can sing praises to in that situation. God turned the mess into a miracle. John's exiled to the island of Patmos. The apostle John put there on the island to die for his testimony of Jesus. Once again, he could have had the attitude, well, Lord, you abandoned me, and why did you let this? No, but the Bible says John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. He was in, man, that speaks volumes to us. 
Man, we, so many times we need everything lined up perfectly for us to be in the Spirit. No, he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, being exiled there. And then God used that mess. He was in a mess. But God turned it into a miracle and gave the Apostle John the greatest revelation of heaven and things to come that he gave anyone the privilege to have. Mess into a miracle. And of course, the greatest example of that is the tomb of Jesus. Laying there cold in the grave. Crucified. It seemed like evil had won. It seemed like the enemies of Jesus had triumphed. It seemed like the powers of darkness had overcome the powers of God. It was a mess from the disciples' perspective. But we know what happened early that Sunday morning, don't we? God turned that mess into a miracle. And he raised Jesus up from the grave. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. And today we have salvation because of that. Turning mess into a miracle. And here we have this story. You say, why did you read that story if you're not going to talk about it? Well, we'll talk about it here for a few minutes now. So let's look at this a little more detail here. His disciples, starting with uh, verse 46. His disciples are on the boat, but Jesus goes up to the mountainside to pray. And may I remind you, the Bible says Jesus lives and he, to constantly intercede for you. Jesus prays for you. Do you know that? Think about that. Jesus prays for me. He prays for you. You say, how can he do that? There's, there's I don't know how many billions on the earth now, eight, nine billion. He prays for me. Yes, because he's God as well as man. He lifts you up by name to the Father. He's praying here. And later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on the land. He saw, notice this, he saw the disciples straining at the oars. May I remind you, Jesus sees you. He sees, I know we know this, but let the Holy Spirit just impress that on you again. He sees you. You may feel like you're straining at the oars. You're fighting whatever it is you're fighting. The wind's against you. You're, you're just struggling to get by day after day. And you don't know what tomorrow will bring. And you don't know what the answer is going to be. But Jesus sees you. You see, when you go to him in prayer, you're not telling God something he doesn't already know. A large part of prayer is simply aligning your faith up with what God says. He sees you. He sees you. He saw his disciples struggling because the wind was against them. And then, I love this, shortly before dawn, he went out to them. He didn't just see them with a nonchalant, oh, look at that, they're struggling, hope they make it. No, he goes out to them. He goes to them. And you're not in this alone. Jesus comes to you. And then verse number 49. But when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost and they cried out because they were all saw him and were terrified. Not the reaction you would think seeing Jesus, but you got to, you know, we got to humanize these disciples. OK, they're struggling for their lives. And the, the last thing in the world they expect to see is Jesus walking on the water toward them. They're seeing what they think is a ghost or an apparition. And they're thinking, boy, that seals our doom right there. That means we're going to die right here. They have no idea at first that it's Jesus. And, you know, sometimes we don't recognize when Jesus comes to us. Sometimes it takes us a minute or two to realize he's with us. <laughs> and we'll go to our prayer closet and we'll start pouring out our heart and, and we'll... God, this is happening, that's happening, the wind's against me, and we're struggling, we're struggling. And all the while, we just then sense his presence come. That ever happened to you? We sense him whispering, peace be still. We sense him giving us strength. 
We pray and pray about something, and then the answer comes. What happened? Well, Jesus was there the whole time. We just didn't know it. But when, when he comes to us in that special way, that's when we recognize it's him. But until then, a lot of times we get terrified with what we're going through. But please understand, Jesus is coming to you. And they were terrified, but immediately he spoke to them. And his words, oh, he says this a lot. <laughs> Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. We're so such fearful people. We tend to just, that's our default position, it is fear instead of faith. And time and time again, Christ comes to us and says, don't be afraid, it is I. Talking about turning a mess into a miracle. You may be in the middle of a mess right now. And you may be like those disciples and the wind's against you. And you're just trying to make it and you don't know if you're going to make it. And maybe your heart's even full of fear or terrified about what might happen and what could happen. But I, what I, God wants to remind you is he's already in the middle of it all. And he's coming toward you. You just need to recognize it. And he's whispering to your ear today... Peace be still. Don't fear. And then the Bible says, he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. The storm ceased. The mess became a miracle. <laughs> and that's the way it is. Jesus turns our messes into miracle if, we let him in the boat with us. It always comes back to us, us giving it to him, us surrendering it to him. You say, I, I did that. Well, maybe you need to do it again. Sometimes we need to do it over and over again because we just keep going back there. Yeah, that's, that's okay. We just need to make sure we let Jesus in the boat. And when he's in there, he takes care of the problem one way or the other. He'll take care of it in his time, in his way. But he'll turn your mess into a miracle. And sometimes God does this through a spectacular way like we read here, like in some of the ways I just conveyed to you. Sometimes it can be a subtle way that God just kind of turns things. Sometimes it can be in an instant where it's just you pray and boom, the answer comes. A lot of times it's over time where God just begins to turn things around. But he will turn your mess into a miracle because he's involved in your life as long as you keep letting him be. So let me give you one more example. We don't have to just read examples in the Bible about this. We can look at everyday life. Let me tell you the story here as I close up here of Elizabeth Elliot. Some of you know who she is. Some of you may not. Elizabeth Elliot is a lady who was married to Jim Elliot. Now, Jim Elliot was a missionary, and he felt called of God to try to evangelize the Aka people of Ecuador. And uh, he felt uh, really uh, led of the Lord to do that. Now, the, the Aka people, they were the ones that were very savage. They were not civilized at all. They were one of the most dangerous indigenous people in all the world. Missionaries did not want to go there. But Jim Elliott really felt the need to minister to these people. And so he began to make plans for it. It wasn't like he just sent something one day and went the next. No, he took years he and his group of missionaries took years to prepare for this. Learning the language, learning the culture, praying, fasting, seeking God over and over and over again. Uh, really trying to, to sense God's leadership in this. But finally they felt that they were ready. And so they began by not just showing up to the village, but they began by dropping gifts from an airplane to this group of people, just to try and break the ice, if you will, to show them that we're friendly, we don't mean you any harm. So they did that for a while, and then they felt like it was time to set up a base camp a few miles from, their, from these people, and so they did that on uh, where these uh, people were at, and, and they set up their base camp, 
And before long, there were a few visitors, representative of the village. And so they conversed with them the best they could. They gave them gifts. They even gave one a ride in their plane. And everything seemed to be going great. And they were praising God. God seems to be opening the doors and breaking down the walls. And these people are starting to trust us and see that we're here in good intent. And so they started making plans then. Uh, he and his other four missionaries to actually enter the village and start talking to them about Jesus. But their plan never came to fruition because before they could ever do that, ten warriors came from the village and murdered Jim Elliot and his other four missionary friends, murdered them in cold blood speared them to death, mutilated their bodies. Well, Elizabeth Elliot, talking about mess to a miracle. Elizabeth Elliot was a newlywed to Jim Elliot. Basically, they, they've been married just a short while. They had one little child, and there she is now. I mean, all they were doing was trying to, to follow God's lead, and then this happens. And Elizabeth Elliot could have very easily, once again, gotten bitter. God, why did you let this happen? None of this, I'm going to give up on you. She didn't do that. I mean, this is an incredible story of, of God's grace at work. What she did, because of the grace of God in her life, is she determined, I'm going to go and minister to those people. And to make a long story short, shortly after this all came out, the door came open for her to go minister to this group. And through her ministry, as well as others, I mean, it was like these murders, these savage murders just changed the whole thing. God just worked it out. And through her ministry and others, people in that group started coming to know Christ as their Savior. And Elizabeth Elliot was able to baptize into the Christian faith the very one who murdered her husband. You talk about a miracle. You talk about turning a mess into a miracle. But that's what God does. That's what God does when we let him. So as we wrap this up, what mess are you in the middle of? What doesn't make any sense to you? God gives us this word to encourage us. God is at work. And if you'll let him, he'll make a miracle out of that mess. So what do we do with this? <laughs> Let's bring to the altar our fears what the enemy's been whispering in our ear like Hezekiah did, and let's lay it at, at God's feet. Let's refuse to, bow, refuse to bow before the idol, refuse to compromise in the midst of whatever storm we're in, like, mag, like, uh, like the three Hebrew children. Let's keep singing praises, even though we might be chained to a dungeon wall right now, like Paul and Silas. Let's stay in the spirit, even though we may feel like we're isolated and alone, like the Apostle John. Let's just let Jesus on our boat. Let's keep him on our boat so he can do his thing. All of that is just a way of saying you need to, during these times, keep your faith in Jesus and your life surrendered in his hands. And God will make your mess into a miracle. So don't give up. Don't give in. Stay close to him. And so I wanted to end by just praying and asking God to help us with that. So whatever it is, give it to him. Yeah, and if you want to come and pray at the altar, feel free to. But let's call upon the Lord. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you, Lord, that 
we can preach what we preached and believe what we believe with full confidence because you are that great and mighty and awesome God that transcends all things, that speaks the universe into existence and by your very power holds the elements of the universe together. Certainly whatever it is we're going through, Lord, whatever it is we're facing right now is not bigger than you. And so, Father, we're going to just keep believing and keep calling upon you that, Lord, you, the master artist, is using these brush strokes to create a miracle that maybe we can't see. Create a masterpiece that we don't understand right now. But every stroke, every heartache, every difficulty, every trial, every tribulation, Lord, as long as we keep holding on to your hand, is part of your master plan. And you will use what Satan meant for evil for our good and for the advancement of your gospel in our life and in the world. So, Father, we're just going to acknowledge we're going to keep trusting in you. We're not going to give up. But sooner or later, Lord, we know that you're going to calm our sea. You're going to see us through the fire. Our prison doors will open. Our chains will fall off. The grave will be empty. Sooner or later, our mess will become that miracle. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us of this today as we surrender this to you. And we thank you for your love for us that makes all this possible. As we pray this in Jesus' mighty, all-powerful name. If you receive God's word this morning, say amen. 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 You are dismissed. Thank you for being here. Remember to call someone text someone, contact someone who's not able to be here um, and let them know they're loved and missed and have a great week in the Lord.